I'm going to start with Matthew 6, 13 through 14. It's about all we, we don't, we don't need any more than this, but I'll go ahead and teach the rest of the outline. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from that evil one. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive them, neither will the Father forgive you. Oh, my goodness. Listen to that. And, you know, we're surrounded and immersed and marinating in people who resent other people, have bitterness against other people, vindictive against other people. And here we go again. God forgave us unconditionally. And we turn around and hold other people's feet to the fire. Colossians 3.13, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a complaint against another, even as Christ has forgiven you, you also must. This is not debated. This is Jesus Christ. This is not an apostle. This is not a prophet of Christ. Jesus Christ is speaking and through uh, that, this incredible thing that defeats the ability to understand that God would allow his son to die as a peace offering for the sins of all humanity, past, present, and the future, where sin itself, as far as God's concerned, has already been quenched. It's already been dealt with. The price has already been paid. And in spite of that unconditional love and acceptance to not just be forgiven, but be the children of God with an inheritance of Jesus Christ, joint as with Jesus Christ. And we got to turn around and keep a grudge against somebody else. Uh -oh. And the rationale, I deal with this all the time. The rationale is how nasty and no good and how bad it was that that person did what they did and hurt you so bad. And God says, you know, I, I, I have this great quality. I'm just, meaning you are becoming your own judge. It won't be me. I'm appointing you a judge of your own life. And when you judge other people without forgiving them, well, don't look at me. You take your own future into your own hands. I, I forgive the whole world, and you can't forgive your son-in-law, your brother-in-law, your mama, the neighbor across the street. Uh, you know... Um, we all go through the neighborhoods and it says, stop. It's not stop if a car is coming. It's stop. Yeah, but nobody's coming. Yeah, but the law is stop. Have you noticed how many, now that Jefferson Parish doesn't have po traffic police, you haven't noticed? four and five cars in a row going through a, uh, a, 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 a stop, a, a red light. No matter who has the right way, they just go because, you know, so what? Who keeps the safe distance between the cars? And, you know, it, people are transgressors. Now, you might be able to get away with traffic. You might want to get away on your IRS form. All y'all can repent right now. Okay. Now, uh, but the deal is nobody's going to get away from Father God. Because he already knows the motives and the intents of all of our hearts. So why should you forgive? Because God told you to. He didn't want to hear your sad story. He forgave all of his enemies and we were once enemies of God. We didn't even know we were. Uh, so we will answer why we should forgive our offenders in this lesson. The scriptural teaching of forgiveness doesn't come up as often, I believe, as it should from ministry in the pulpits these days. 
Uh, you know, everything is health, wealth, wisdom, have a nice life, and so on. Forgiveness is a necessary foundational issue for Christian maturity. Our focus today is not so much about God forgiveness towards us. That's done. But it is about our forgiveness towards other people that we live with in our personal relationships. And you don't have to go much further than a marriage. Do you know why God made women and men so different? so that in that union, you would be aware of your carnality. You understand that? And for the slow learners, he invented children. And, and you understand that? And then, uh, you know, in-laws and outlaws and neighbors and people you work with and so on, so on. Ephesians 4.32, now listen, here's a command. Be kind and tender-hearted to one another, forgiving each other. Ooh, look at this. Just as, not sort of, kind of like, but just as Christ forgave you. This is between me and Jesus. It's between you and Jesus to forgive other people no matter how no good low down they are. It's not debatable. It's not if you would. If you could find it in your heart, you know, you just, just, just imagine, you know, that they're not as bad as they are. And if you would, would you just, 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 you know, no, forgive them just as Christ forgave you unconditionally with no sad story, no justification, no excuses. And I don't know how many of us come close to this. That's a scary thing. Forgiving others is an essential and necessary part of discipleship. Mike and Elaine were called to make disciples. That's what we do. We, we preach a gospel to make disciples, the commands of Christ, to do as much as you can to obey the kingdom. Even at the best, in our marriages, our families, our workplaces, even in church, we often offend other people purposely or unknowingly. And we're easily offended by other people. We say the wrong things and react in unchristian ways. We have all offended people causing others to stumble. If that's a, a Christian, I sure don't want to go to the church. I mean, the way that guy did that, you see, the world looks at that and then judges church and Jesus Christ and everything else by us. And sometimes, you know, we just don't have enough grace to put up with people. And so we easily offend and become offended. So we often cross the lines in indiscretion in an unchristian manner. We have shown preferential treatment to some and disrespected other people. Do you know, uh, we, we just, you know, we have people that we like and we have people we don't like with people that we, we need and people we don't need. And, and we're, we, you know, we're so conditional on how we treat other people. We can ignore other people or we can try to manipulate other people. Now, even in the church body, unconsciously, or I wrote purposely, we offend just by being a human being with a fallen nature. Is that right? You have to say, man, that woman gets on my last nerves. I wish she'd just shut up. I wish I could snap my fingers and you just disappear, you know? Uh, you know, that's it. Uh, we ain't putting up with them. We ain't never going to ask them out again. Uh-uh, they Now, cut them off. Don't answer that phone. It's possible that we have this little circle of our kingdom that we have rules and regulations, and we're not convicted that because other people just don't come up to our standard, they don't deserve us to be that nice to them. And if they want me to be nice, you be nice to me, I be nice to you. You know, be nice to me, I know be nice to you. 
and then uh, I think I <laughs> so to be a disciple, it is absolutely essential, mandatory that we live in constant forgiveness for other people because we stumble all day long, even in our thoughts and imaginations that we don't even allow other people to know. Yet God knows, and the Holy Spirit is so close to your heart, he's aware of everything. Oh, James 3, 2, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not offend in what he says, he must be a perfect man and able to bridle his whole body. Anybody here ever, ever regret as soon as you were saying it is something you said? Yeah, like all day yesterday and half of this morning. And not as bad this morning as this morning because this was church morning. So we've got to watch ourselves so we can be as holy as we can going to church. And we'll just save all of it for Monday. <laughs> oh, my God. You know, when Jesus, when, when Peter asked Jesus, it's in my nose, but when Peter heard about Jesus saying love and unconditionally, he goes, look, how about this? My brother sins against me. How often? I'm willing now. I'm willing to forgive him up to seven times. How about that, Jesus? And Jesus said, no, no. Seven times 70. And if you're counting, you never forgave in the first place. Ain't no keeping score. All right. Now, as disciples of Christ, all offenses should be responded to with an attitude of Christ-like forgiveness, not our reaction to them. You make me so mad. When you talk like that, I'll get so that I need to knock, knock your head off. I mean, so I, yeah, and, and you, you, wait, wait, are you reacting to your offender or are you responding to Christ Jesus Unforgiveness unchecked finally destroys all relationships. We should realize it isn't the offense that destroys the marriage, the family relationship, the friendship, the church unity. It's the inability to forgive that destroys it. See, we make the event the problem. He did that. She didn't do that. I can't believe they did that. See, so, so we have a reason but no, it's your inability to forgive as Christ wants you to forgive as much as life within you that's going to destroy the relationship. And the problem is then we go to church and we raise our hands, how great thou art, and uh, we full of iniquity, justification, which is, becomes strange fire before the Lord. Iniquity is a terrible, terrible, terrible thing worse than any physical disease because we justify our, you know, uh, our rebellion to do what God wants us to do. Luke 17, 1. Y'all don't mind if I use the Bible, huh? Uh, Jesus said to his disciples, it is impossible that offenses won't come into your life. But woe to him through whom they come, and the last words, what sorrow awaits them, either in this life or the life to come, because we will all stand before the Lord and give an account. You cause another Christian to stumble. God said, now you're going to be accountable for that. And if you are the cause of your rejection, resentment, bitterness, and so on. God said, not only will you suffer broken relationships and potential in this life, you will answer to me. That's a horrifying thought. Brother Mike, you, you, you putting the fear of God in me. Well, as much as I, that, that's what I'm trying to do. Okay. Why? Because that's the beginning of wisdom. 
and we all need to fear God. We, we do what we do and we think what we think quietly inside and imagine and we all, all we can play all these little movies and the Holy Spirit is there all the time knowing even the motives of our heart and we act like he's not there. I'm just telling you my story. Now, I realize most of you that come to the 1030 service, this message, you don't need this message, but this is for the Lutherans and the Methodists that are watching my live stream, okay? Again, Jesus said to his disciples, it is impossible that no offenses will come, but woe to him through whom they do come, what sorrow awaits them. A fact of this life is that personal offenses will continuously come. Our Lord Jesus said that offenses will come, so they're going to come. Offending and becoming offended in life is just the natural living this life with our fallen nature and other people's fallen nature. Even in church, disciples clash with believers who have not been perfected. Do you know I have to now and then adjust individuals in this church? Intercessory prayer, um, uh, in ministry, they get sideways with one another. Now think about that. Okay, so th this is not us against the demon-possessed world. This is us dividing the body of Christ. And we got good reasons. <laughs> yeah, I'll let y'all interpret it in any way you want. How we respond to offenses decides the health of our relationships and others, and especially God, and our own health of our physical bodies. It is true in marriage, family, and friendship, and church. Forgiveness is the disciplined path to joy, satisfaction, and fulfillment in the family and the church. Now, the average church, uh, church person knows that we should be having a joyful experience as children of God in his kingdom. But most Christians don't have joy. The reason they don't have joy is joy is the opposite of guilt. The day you got saved and you really believed you unloaded all of your sin debt and you were no longer guilty, you had intoxicating joy and peace that passeth natural understanding. But then little by little, we had grudges and, and offenses and unforgiveness along the way, and it squeezed out our joy because down inside, we really know we stand guilty before God. So we try to make it up religiously by doing religious things, reading our Bible chapter each day or whatever we do. Well, you know, it's a little by little, but we don't let loose of the grudges. That's a sad thing that God talked about the, the man who came to the king that owed the king a tremendous amount. And the king said, look, that's okay. Even Stephen, I'll forgive you of the debt. Then he went out and a guy had, had owed him $5 or some ridiculous little thing. And he, he, put, he put that guy's feet to the fire and he was even going to put him in prison. And the king found out about it. He said, I forgave you for much. This guy is a little thing and you won't let loose. Well, I tell you what, you're the judge of yourself. Now, head to the prison. He's going to turn you over to the tormentors. Depression, anxiety, worry, and night terrors, uh, insomnia, whatever. And even worse, uh, bitterness in your bones. Destroying the red blood cells with the oxygen that can't go to your brain correctly. Sickness and disease. I'm just saying Romans 12, 17 through 19. Do not repay evil for evil. Even if what they did to you was evil, you have no right 
to give evil. You can't match evil with evil. And again, this is not debatable. This is not sociology. This is not psychology. This is not humanity traits. This is the word of God. Carefully consider what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone, emphasis everyone, all the time, everywhere. Beloved, do not take revenge for yourselves, but rather give place to God because God has a ministry called vengeance. And when you will not forgive someone and you hold their feet, the judgment on them, and you execute judgment on them, and you hold them at a distance and you defame them and you hold them responsibility, responsible how you feel, you have displaced God from his rightful position. It, do you know God's not seeking a position? He's not applying for instance. God is in his righteous authority over everything. And it's not debatable, it's not replaceable, and you can't move him out the way. But when you decide that you have a right over God's right, now you're in deep stuff. And the problem with rejecting God as ultimate authority over your life is the next step is grand delusion. He will replace truth and allow you to believe lie after lie until you don't realize how foolish you are. The inability to forgive destroys relationships. It also destroys the lives of those not willing to forgive as God commands, not as Mike commands, not as a, a ch church doctrine says. God said, Father God said, the scriptural reality is forgiveness is willfully self-destructed. In other words, we know that when you hold another person liable for the way you feel, it's like drinking poison. You are the one that is dying because it's self-destructive. When I was working on my doctorate with psychology, uh, even in, in the worldly psychology, they know that resentment and bitterness disturbs your your intestines, where all of your um, self-defense against germs and so on. Um, Brother Wayne, time and time again, uh, called to somebody who died in the hospital and he get a word of knowledge and, 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 and speak to them uh, on their, their deathbed about needing someone they needed to forgive. And you get to get, a, when, if they accept that, you begin to see life come back into them. Unforgiveness is a trick of the devil because in our natural mind, we feel like that person needs to be punished, cut off, lie, uh, let everybody know how no good they are. But the problem is, it's like stabbing yourself in the heart, hitting yourself in the head with a hammer over and over again. And the further you go, the more you don't realize how far you are walking away from God. There's got to be reasons other than adultery and robbing and sleeping and murder for Jesus to say, uh, in that day, many will come to me and say, I did this and depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Remember, iniquity is justifying disobedience and rebellion against God because you have a better idea. He wasn't talking to you because your enemy is so no good. Hmm. 
the inability to forgive destroys relationships. It also destroys the lives of those not willing to forgive God's commands. The scriptural reality is unforgiveness is willfully self-destructive. Scripture clearly warns us that unforgiveness becomes bitterness of the heart. So the root of bitterness invites destructive hatred. Hatred, uh, anger, and bitterness force an intense internal in your mind need for that person to be hurt. Malice. They, you want them to feel pain. You want them to die. You want them to lose their job. You want them to get out of your life. Murder, biblically, is not just shooting somebody in the head, stabbing them. Murder is when you willfully want someone executed from your life. God put them in their life, but do you be aware of your shortcomings so that you would repent? But we want all of these bad people just to, you know, we just want them gone. Scripture clearly warns us that unforgiveness becomes bitterness of the heart. The root of bitterness invites destructive anger. And eventually, bitterness is not just heartfelt. Bitterness becomes what you are. See, you can be bitter. You can feel bitter. But if you don't repent of it, if you don't forgive, you become a bitter person. See, you can tell little lies, but if you don't repent of it, you now become a liar. We all judge people, but if you don't repent of that, you become a judge, and therefore now you seal your fate because as you judge, so you shall be judged. It's an incredible thing. You go to God and say, and she did this, and he did that, and she did that. And God said, wait a minute. What you belly aching about? You do the same thing. See, now, when, if God says you do the same thing, now when we judge that person, yes, we're judging that person based on how we know we are. And God says, I got clean hands. I told you, I didn't forgive you. But if you don't want to forgive, you'll be your own judge. And, and this is how you're going to know. You say you love me this way, but you can't, you, 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 you're judging other people. Therefore, go ahead and be your judge. Now, don't look at me. You judge yourself. I'm called just. Only God could have come up with that. That is so not human being. <laughs> we have such a need to be justified with our problems with other people. <laughs> Hebrews 12, 14 through 15, the NIV, make every effort. I wish I could say I always make every effort. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. Who? Everyone. Who's everyone? Well, everyone. <laughs> Say it ain't so. No, it is. Everyone. And to live a holy life. Now, let's say, what is a holy life? A holy life is imitating Jesus Christ's relationship with other people. It's not not drinking wine at Thanksgiving. It's it's not smoking camels. It's not it, it's imitating the life of Jesus Christ. How did he treat other people, including his enemies? Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to live a holy life. For those without holiness will not see the Lord. See to it that you do not fall short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springing up destroy all of the family, all the friends. You ever notice divorce causes a direct division because friends of the, each couple have to decide 
whose side they're on and who they're against. Family members have to do that. Every church, wherever bitterness comes in, it's, it causes divisions and breaks up of people who had nothing to do with it. And then if they don't know who they are in Christ, they pick up the offense of the wife or of the husband or the mother or the father or the friend. And they, and, and they have no grace to be able to forgive them because it never, they were not in that. But if you want to go ahead and pick up an offense that somebody else, now it's, now you have infected yourself. Forget COVID. You can't put a mask on you on that. And the devil knows this. So when people come to you to tell you how bad junkyard dog done, they've been wrong and how they've been this and that and humility and everything. And then you go, oh, with your bleeding heart, I understand how you feel. Yeah, that's bad. Now you help justify them in that bitterness. Now you pick up an offense. Because you did not instruct that person in forgiveness. So now you give them a license, approval to nurse a hurt. So God says, well, whose side are you on? See, I always try to put everything that happens in our lives. I try to find where is God in this? But I also try to find where in the hell is the devil in this? There is no seducer like the devil. And so we're so Christian, we want to, you know, we want to help that person. And, we, and so we, we, we help them justify their hurt instead of bringing them to conviction and repentance. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm glad you clapped. I don't know why, but I'm glad you clapped. You know, because I, I, I felt it on my own head here. Yeah, hey, madre mia. I didn't want to clap. I wanted to run. Yeah. Hey. Now, listen. My life, I felt led of God to work on getting a doctorate in psychology because I was involved uh, at that time with mental things and so on, and I wanted to know, I felt like God wanted me to do it. So worldly psychologists and so-called life coaches, we didn't have life coaches in, on the West Bank of New Orleans. It's a new thing. I mean, the internet has birthed hundreds of people who have no experience in life as life coaches. But have you noticed, if you read the news, a lot of those young life coaches are dead. They're dying of all kinds of crazy things and so on. Uh, your life, you, let me tell you who your life coach is. The indwelling Holy Spirit, that's who your life coach is. The living Word of God, that's who your life coach is. But these so-called life coaches have proposed that forgiveness is to be avoided. Now, that's the opposite of what God says. They believe foolishly that forgiveness is not emotionally or mentally healthy for you. They advise their offended clients to their offended clients, you don't need to just carry that pain of that offense. You need to get final resolution, which is vengeance. Their counsel is the best and healthiest way for you to get final resolution of your offense is to unyieldingly, forcefully be vindictive until that person is found out and pays the price. Opposite. You know why we like Rocky? You know why we like a lot of the, we, we, uh, Batman and all that kind of stuff? We like superheroes because you know what? They like the saints. Let's tear up them dirty birds. Just, just smash them till they, they feel the hurt. They don't even, they know, they know we the winner. We're the champions. 
You see, unrelenting, let's pay them back. That's the picture's world. And you know, we, we, we know we shouldn't do that because we're church people. So we just like to watch it in a movie. <laughs> Vicariously, beat the hell out of him, man. I mean, gouge his eye out, kick his butt. <laughs> Pass the popcorn, Elaine. <laughs> we like... We like vicariously to have people get revenge over the bad guys. It helps us in the feeling of powerlessness that we can't do anything about our sister-in-law, the boss, the secretary, the lady across the street who walks her dog only on your lawn. Uh. All of these people, all of these people, I finally found out why there are 18 wheelers. God wanted Mike Mele to know I'm not wonderful. Uh, uh, uh. When I'm trying to get somewhere and two 18-wheelers drive 20 miles an hour in both lanes blocking 100 cars just because they can. And I go, oh, praise the Lord. I had a neighbor that decided that when I wanted to go to sleep, his, he would play basketball right outside my window. You understand that? And I realized, what a gift from heaven he is. I would have thought I was a good Christian. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, right. There's a popular book called Toxic Parents. It's been accepted as psychological wisdom. The author has a chapter entitled, You Don't Have to Forgive Your Parents. She says that children who have not been, who have been offended by the behavior of their parents must not forget nor forgive their parents. The opposite of, Honor your mother and father no matter how no good they were. Yeah. The first commandment with a promise that if you do, as understanding authority God put above you, life will go well from you. So all these snowflakes and these generations right now are being taught to uh, disregard their parents. Now, they don't disregard them and disrespect them enough to move out of the garage. <laughs> or have their parents, you know, pay for their food and do their laundry and so on. Oh. <clears throat> so this so-called expert instructs in the book that offended children must heap on their parents the full blame for their children's present problems that they can't keep a job, that they're morally, uh, they don't know, they just, they, they in debt, they, they owe on their college and whatever, uh, because she declares that it was because of their parents poisoning them by parental toxicity. She suggests their stand should be, I was victimized by mom and dad, so it's not my fault that I am a, a living wreck. I'm not responsible for what my parents did to me. The guilt for their troubled life choices is pushed off onto someone else, primarily their toxic parents. Their failures in life are not their responsibility. They are further recommended to make a commitment to vengeance and that that desire for vengeance to be not only exalted, but Look, fully exhausted for the final resolvement that the only way you're going to be mentally and physically healthy again is to make your parents pay. 
Do you remember a couple of years ago when all of a sudden you started hearing about teenagers suing their parents? Suing the parents? Oh, my God. Huh. Get back to your notes, Mike. However, the costly price of choosing vengeance is extremely high. An unforgiving attitude of bitterness ruins bitter lives deeply. A burning desire for vengeance born out of vindictiveness, hate, or anger will damage in many ways, mentally, emotionally, physically, relationally, and most damaging of all, spiritually. Because if you do not forgive, you will not have eternal life. I don't care what else you think justifies you. Father God will not forgive you and you will pay. It is accepted medical fact that unforgiveness fosters destruction of the immu immune system. Primarily, bitterness imprisons unforgiven people in their hurtful past. The loss of future life potential is an expensive price to pay for holding an unforgiving heart. Unforgiveness changed people to their past. If a person will not forgive and not put the past in the past, but continues to seek vengeance, they are shackled by themselves to the past giving up any relationship with God. You see, when you are abused, betrayed, lied on, scandalized, defrauded by somebody in an event, and you make it your current and future at, uh, environment, you are always chained to your past, you can never go into your potential in the future. The main reason Jesus wanted you to forgive is that you could walk and live in the spirit and then wind up with your inheritance in eternal glory. But if as long as you are chained to an event that happened. Now, I am schooled and credentialized with uh, dealing with trauma. Post-traumatic stress, uh, look, post-traumatic. It happened in the past. Right. I had young men that were my friends at, in high school who wound up being drafted going to, who died over there. But the ones who didn't die are still fighting the war. The difference with trauma is that the event never is in the past. It has moved now into the day. And you live it 24 hours a day. When there is an attra a traumatic divorce, fighting over children and everything else, and, and, and there's terrible things, and your person picks up an injury mentally, emotionally, spiritually in that, what happens is that divorce produces trauma. But without forgiveness, on the anniversary the next year of that date of that divorce, the person experiences the same emotional train wreck is that. Then the third year, the fourth year, the fifth year, until they are just absolutely not being able to recover from that. This is what happens with people, women that, that commit an, uh, an abortion. They have somebody agreed with them, they, they, their circumstances, what they were, but now every time they see a child, every time something happens, they bring back that, that guilt that they had, that toxic thing, over and over again, and it multiplies. Philippians 3, 13 through 14. Brethren and sistren, this one thing I do. What's the one thing you do, Paul? Forgetting those things what happened in the past. Put a lily on it, cry, weep, then walk away from it and leave it behind. Don't go dig up the hamster that was in the, the matchbox. It dead, it died, leave it back there. Don't fool with it. Walk away, have nothing to do with dead things. The past is gone. You have no power to fix the past. 
you have total power called grace to create the future. People who will not let loose of the past that happened to them with all their 99 good reasons why they hold on to that don't recognize its personal pride. <laughs> they want control over that offender. James 4, 6 says, God will give you grace, supernatural power to be able to forgive if you humble yourself and identify with Jesus Christ. But when you will not forgive, because of your reasons, your justifications, there is no grace to do something that takes supernatural power. <laughs> and most people who hang on to their problems and, and, and everybody, they, they, they're in debt, they're, they're half crazy, they mess up their relationships, they can't keep a job, what's one thing after another, don't realize as they blame that person it's them that has been destroyed. So they are mentally, emotionally, and absolutely spiritually off the charts. And there is no grace until you will bow the knee and agree with God and do what God says. But until that time, your pride exalts yourself to God's level. You are your own, uh, your own God your own Lord, and you take life the way you want to take it. Primarily bitterness imprisons a person, unforgiving people in their, their past. They're shackled and cannot walk with God. Philippians 3, 13 through 14, brethren, this one thing I do, forget it. Those refusing to forgive are bound to the past event's memory. The pain of that event is continuously fed and so kept alive. Listen, you say, the little grand, the great grandchildren, man, he's getting big. And the mom and daddy say, yeah, we, we, we still feeding him. <laughs> see, as long as you feed him, he grows. As long as you feed your tragedy, your unforgiveness, it grows. It takes more territory. It gets stronger. It's more powerful. You can't feed it in your thought life. You can't feed it with your mouth, with your decisions in life. You cannot do that. Eventually, the traumatic bondage becomes worse than the hurt that happened. You understand that? See, the event happens and that sets you off, but when you don't forgive it, now that pain is continuing and it even grows, because you're always talking about your offender. Your offender is in the Caribbean on a cruise ship, enjoying himself from a, with a woman in a bikini, sucking on lobster claws, and, and, and your bowels are all messed up. And he ain't thinking about you. But you can't even sleep thinking about him. Unforgiveness is a choice to love hating your offender. Why say love? Because whatever you love and worship are, are the same spiritual word, meaning where do you put your attention in the most uh, emotionalized way? When you will not stop hating, you have now become an idolater and you love to always hate that person because that's always where your most intense emotions are. <laughs> Unforgiveness becomes a malignant infection. Why? Because now it's not just in your mind, not just in your emotions, it's in your guts, it's in every cell of your body. Willful unforgiveness thrives on distorted memories of both life and God. Unresolved anger becomes out of control with emotions unchecked, with imaginations of desired revenge, 
conversations with others always becomes an opportunity to slander your offender, tell them how no good he or she was. Uh, you have a victim's mentality and that thrives on defaming the other person, uh, exaggerating how, how bad it was. And even if that's not, if they're not getting it, even lies, making it worse than what it was so that you can have the other person join your team against that person. Submitting to God by forgiveness liberates to live with peace in your own heart. Forgiveness is a freeing reality. Scripture exalts forgiveness, not only for reasons of your deliverance and liberation from the past hurtful events, but the greater reason is that forgiveness honors your God. You're doing what God wants you to do. God wants you to forgive because you now witness the un conditional love of the Father. The Bible reveals at least 25 word pictures of forgiveness. I, would would, I, would y'all want to hear some of them? I, look, if I go too long, would, would y'all forgive me? Okay. Uh, to forgive is to turn the key open and open the cell door and let the prisoner free. To forgive is to write in large letters across a debt, nothing else is owed. To forgive is to pound the gavel in a courtroom and declare the person completely not guilty. To forgive is to shoot an arrow so far and so high that it can never be retrieved. To forgive is to take out the garbage and dispose of it, leaving the house fresh and clean. To forgive is to free the anchor and set the ship free to sail again. To forgive is to grant a full pardon to a condemned and sentenced offender. To forgive is to loosen the stranglehold on a wrestling opponent. To forgive is to sandblast a wall of graffiti, leaving it looking brand new. To forgive is to smash a clay pot into a thousand pieces so it can never be put back together. These are pictures of forgiveness that are very instructive. Forgiveness is a marvelous virtue and liberating godly attitude. It just makes good sense to agree with God to forgive. It is healthy and wholesome. It is sensible, freeing, brings peace, invites love, and again, honors God. Proverbs 19.11 says this, a man's foolishness is not to forgive. Someone was writing about forgiveness, and I thought it was interesting in this way. He says, only the brave ones know to forgive. It is the most generous element of human virtues. Cowards never forgive. It's not in their nature. And I wrote this, cowards cannot forgive because of their fear of loss over the control they have of holding that person liable. If they forgive, they lose control and they feel like that person wins. They simply cannot or will not trust God in obedience to forgive and let God seek vengeance. As disciples, we are compelled to a deeper motivation. Forgiveness is the noblest of all Christ-like virtues. The trait of forgiveness may be so isolated to very few in the world, it may indeed be a rare commodity, but forgiveness must not be rare among us as believers. It should be the most normal of all of our Christian behaviors, showing the world unconditional forgiveness. Matthew 18, 21, then Peter came to Jesus and asked him, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my offender who sins against me? As many as seven times, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seven times 70. Finally, forgiveness is necessary in our daily collisions with believers and sinners. Forgiveness defines the future of both life and family and in the church. Forgiveness is needed from a believer because forgiveness is the most God-like act a Christian can do. Would you stand with me, please? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thanks for joining us today. Hope you were encouraged and blessed by the word. And if you'd like to partner with us at White Dove, I want to share a couple of ways that you can give to this ministry. First, you can text the letters WDF 
888-245-7777. Or you can go to our website at whitedove.org. Thanks again, and God bless.